thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Ben Schramm. I'm a product manager on the Google Expeditions team. Uh, and I'm really excited to be joined here uh, by Jen and Rob, two of my colleagues. Uh, we're really just a, a part, though, of a small community of, of really, really passionate people here at Google uh, who think technology can really change education. Uh, and if it's not obvious already, by virtue of the, the session, uh, we're especially ex excited about the role VR can play uh, in education. So we've just returned, a little exhausted, but super encouraged, uh, from a year-long trip that we've taken. And that trip has been to try to bring VR to as many teachers and students around the world as we could. Uh, and as Clay announced yesterday, we've managed to bring expeditions to over a million students since last year. It's a number we're really, really proud of, and it's been an amazing journey. But so much of the credit uh, for what follows actually goes to the amazing group of teachers and students uh, who joined us along the way. We've encountered so much enthusiasm. Uh, we've received so much amazing uh, feedback from them. Uh, and we're really, really grateful to everyone who has participated and who continues to participate. So I'm going to start with some thoughts about why VR and education uh, are a really good match. And then Jen's going to talk a little bit about Google Expeditions and our Pioneer program. And then Rob's going to talk about the future of VR and education as we see it. So let's start with the why. Like, why did we originally create Google Expeditions? And why do we think VR platforms like Daydream uh, will offer so much potential for educators and learners? Why should developers like yourselves be interested in developing educational apps for VR? So let's start with a quick show of hands. How many of you remember studying really, really hard for a test in school? How many? Most of you. How many of you forgot everything that you studied the second after the test? Exactly the same number, right? Like, how many of you think you could do well on that test again right now? Not a lot. OK. <laughs> so how many of you remember a trip that you've taken to an interesting place, a country, a museum, something like that, about the same number? How many of you can recall details about that trip? A lot of you, right? OK, so therein lies like, one of the reasons why we find the emergence of widely accessible VR technology so exciting for education. And Google I.O. is no place to temper one's enthusiasm, so I'll make a bold claim that many of us who think about educational technology VR is sort of the thing we've been waiting for, because it allows us to address one of the most important but neglected areas of learning. And I want to spend a few minutes digging into why. So to start with, let's take a really, really big step back. Historically, most of the technology that we've developed to aid learning has been aimed to enable access to information, facts, details, other observations about the world. And for most of uh, human history, a smart person has basically been someone who knew a lot of facts. And fact retention is what a lot of the technology that we built directly supports. I'm talking about things like the book, right? Or libraries of books, catalog that let you easily access tons and tons of information quickly. Search engines, like one you might recognize here, uh, have only served to make this kind of fact retrieval breathtakingly fast, comprehensive, and easy. Even the rapid growth of technology like laptops and tablets and smartphones in schools has only really served to help you assimilate information and then turn around and evaluate how well you did at absorbing it and recalling it. But while information is super, super important, it's not even close to the full story when it comes to learning. Let me give you one example of this. All right, so here's a math problem. There are 26 goats and 10 sheep on a boat. How old is the captain of the boat? <laughs> so a study done in the US to a bunch of fifth graders in the 90s asked this question. And three-fourths of those students produced a numerical answer to this question. The most common answer was 36. There were some 16s. And amazingly, there was one 260. <laughs> <laughs> A quote from one of the students who answered 36 said, well, for this type of problem, you need to add or subtract or multiply. And for this one, it seemed it was best to add. <laughs> right? And the important point, these kids are not stupid at all. These are smart kids. Um, but they're kids for whom the traditional approaches to teaching mathematics are failing. Let me give you one uh, a little bit more complicated example. A study done in the 90s found that when students were taught geography, in a traditional way by sort of memorizing all the states and where they go and the state capitals with a worksheet like this, 
they were largely incapable of naming or placing those same states in the correct places when the borders were removed like that. They were basically clueless the second the map changed. But the study found that another group of students who had spent some time discussing concepts like why rivers and mountain ranges are natural borders, they were much more capable of placing states in the right spots. And the reason that's important is that simple techniques that literally, in this case, ground information about which states are where serve students uh, to understand the important concepts of why, like why are the borders where they are. And learning this way is powerful because it allows for much more improved sort of knowledge transfer. It allows you to apply the same thing you learn there somewhere else. So you could logically apply these same lessons to a map of Europe or whatever. Let me give you another very different example. We've long known that we have really, really powerful and innate spatial memories, even if we didn't understand the mechanisms. This is like the reason why most of you guys can remember the trips, and none of us can remember uh, the test. Right? And here's actually a, a medieval representation of the brain that tried to understand it as actually a series of spaces where you crammed memories and facts, like an attic or something. They actually weren't that far off. It's the same insight that has given rise to that mnemonic device called a memory palace or a mind palace. That, for those of you who don't know what that is, it basically involves using the mem our memory of a place, our better spatial memory, the rooms in like a familiar building, like your house or the, your street, as a structure in which to place the arbitrary facts that you remember, say in this picture, like a large number of amphibious species. So each thing that you want to remember gets associated with a physical space that you already know. And then when you want to recall them, you visualize that space you know, and you use them as a trigger for that set of arbitrary facts. And we've known that this works for a long time. Cicero used it to remember long, long speeches. But it's a capability that traditional academics rarely, rarely tap. It's one that's easy to see VR making use of, though. Okay. It's only recently that we've really begun to understand why this works, though, at least scientifically. The last 30 or so years have seen a revolution in the study of cognition, and especially in the study of the science of learning. For one, we understand that learning actually changes the physiology of the brain. And we can actually look for that when we're studying learning. We also know that scientific, we have scientific evidence that being smart is not about being informed. For instance, studies have shown that very young children with very little information quickly understand fundamental concepts of numbers, physics, and logic. And they can learn these really quickly. So it turns out that kids like my eight-month-old are, in fact, very smart very ignorant, little experts in learning. And this one remains a novice in sleeping. <laughs> and now that we all have supercomputers in our pockets, the notion of what smart is really needs to change, right? Because being smart isn't about being able to repeat and remember information. Technology does an amazing job of doing that for us. Being smart is being able to effectively use information and locate it within concepts. So as Herbert Simon says here, the new smart is being able to sort out what's deserving of our attention. And given that most of us have jobs today that didn't even exist when we were born, the ability to learn is more important than ever. OK. So I'm sure you're all surprised that I'm not a cognitive scientist, given my 30-second recap of 30 years of nuanced study. But the thing that I'm excited to take away from this is that it confirms what great educators have long known that the days that people learn best, that the teachers who inspire their students the best, that the days when school is the most effective are the ones that put learners in the position to discover for themselves, to organize those facts into concepts, to turn misconceptions into metacognition, or these moments where you're aware of your own learning and you can actually think and reflect on it. And even if we haven't had the science to prove it until recently, we've known about this for a really, really long time. It almost seems trite when you read it, but Aristotle was actually being sort of profoundly insightful when he claimed that we learn by doing things. Right? It's all the more profound when you go into schools and you see how little learning actually happens by doing. Even more contemporary people, like one of the great thinkers of pedagogy, John Dewey, was telling us 100 years ago that if we want to foster learning, we have to give students something to do, not something to learn. And this is when ed tech was like books on a chalkboard. right? One of our most influential current thinkers about educational technology, Seymour Papert, he was the guy that created the first programming language for kids, noted that teachers should concern themselves with creating the conditions for learning, 
rather than providing inf information. And that's one of the reasons why he was so passionate about the freedom of expression kids get by learning how to write software. But even though we've long had these intuitions, we've had experts telling us this, and now we have science confirming this, we don't really have the technology to scale this stuff. If you think about it, the technology that we use is amazing. My favorite days that I remember as a student were in science labs. Being able to look at things up close, not being able to predict the outcome, these are amazing moments. But this technology is really hard to scale. It's expensive, it breaks, and it's constrained by time and safety considerations. In many, many countries and places, these moments just don't happen. And even more recently, we've seen this like, explosion of really, really cool robots and stuff in, in schools that help you learn how to code and help you do logic. Again, though, these things are expensive, they're hard to scale, and they're relatively limited in the number of things that they can do. Even the classic technology of this big yellow bus that takes us on field trips, again, amazing moments. It's really expensive, and it's super limited by time and space. VR gives us newfound powers to scale and make experiential, dynamic, engaging learning a much, much more regular occurrence. And the economics of VR for schools looks really different when a single device can be your science lab, can be your programmable robot, can give you access to museums, and can be your school bus. The very cool thing that is happening is that the same technological revolution that demands we all get to be better learners, it's the same technology that's going to help us scale that type of learning. And to talk about our first project towards that goal, I'd like to invite Jen. Thanks, Ben, for the history lesson. <laughs> so I'm a program manager on Google Expeditions. And at Google I.O. last year, we announced Expeditions, a new virtual reality app for schools. And instead of just releasing that app, we actually piloted with hundreds of schools all over the world to better understand how this could be a powerful learning tool. And it represents the first deployment of VR technology in schools at scale. And so for those of you that might not know what Expeditions is, it combines three things. One, it's software built alongside teachers and students. Two, immersive virtual reality content. And three, devices that are available to any school. All you need is a smartphone, a VR viewer, and a tablet and you're able to teleport all over the world. Actually, you can teleport all over the universe with expeditions. And you can laugh and learn like you're actually there. And so the expeditions themselves are comprised of virtual reality panoramas. There are 360 degree photospheres that are annotated with descriptions and points of interest, which make it really easy for the teacher to actually incorporate it into their lesson. And when a teacher points something out on their tablet, an arrow pops up on the student device, directing the students to look in that particular direction. And as Ben mentioned, we were able to bring over 1 million students on an expedition in 11 countries. And I want you to think about that number for a second. Imagine Shoreline Amphitheater here at Google I.O. filled with students, every single seat is a student. Now multiply that by 150, and that's how many students have actually gone on an expedition this school year. And it's still happening today. If you were to pull out your phone and look on Twitter and look at the hashtag Google Expeditions, you are going to see so many kids smiling and excited about learning. And I definitely encourage you to do it. Just do it after our session. And we're able to reach that many students because of how accessible the hardware is. You don't need all these cords and fancy headsets. You just need devices that are currently off the shelf, that you can pull off the shelf. So let's take a look at what one of those classrooms is experiencing. And we'll, we'll visit this school that's in Eagle Grove, Iowa. If we can cue the video. Actually, don't, just kidding. Don't, don't cue that. <laughs> um, when we visited schools, before we, before we visited schools, we wanted the day to feel really special. And we wanted you know, the kids to be excited about their virtual field trip, just like they would a normal field trip. 
And so we provided the students with the gear that they would need to be able to go on this expedition. Just like a normal physical field trip, you've got to take notes and write down your observations and be able to share them uh, with your peers. And so the same thing applied with expeditions. And that feedback has been amazing. And so now we'll actually uh, cue the video. My name is Lance Teasley. I'm in middle school in Eagle Grove, Iowa. Eagle Grove is not a very tall place. It's actually very flat. This is the tallest building on Main Street. It is about 50 feet tall. When I grew up, I want to be an architect and design skyscrapers. Yesterday at school, we went on a class trip. But this was not a normal trip with buses. This was something very different. The very first expedition we went on was to the Burj Khalifa. Go ahead and grab two hands and put them up to your face. It's so tall. OK, we're going to go to the 153rd floor. The best part of my job was getting, throughout this whole year, has actually been, abling, been able to go and visit these schools, like visit uh, students uh, like Lance. So initially, when we thought about expeditions, we thought it would be about taking kids to the most majestic places all over the world. We thought it was like taking students to the Taj Mahal. We thought it would, might be about exploring the Great Barrier Reef or Mount Everest or even Mars. But what we quickly found out was that expeditions is so much more than that. It's actually about enabling kids to visit places that might be nearby, but they might not be able to get to. So this picture is actually a picture from a middle school, prior middle school in Montana. And many of the students are of Crow uh, descent. And every August, there's this huge powwow and celebration of the Crow tribe that happens in Montana. And many of these students, who live three hours away from where the celebration is, weren't actually able to go. So we took our Odyssey rig, Google's jump camera with GoPro, and we brought it, and we placed it right in the middle of that powwow, and right next to the horses, so that all the students could see the horse parade. And we took it inside teepees, so that students could see how a teepee is made. And we built that ex those expeditions, and then we took it to the middle school so that those students could all participate in the celebration. But what was amazing was that those expeditions were used around the world to celebrate that weekend. And we also know that historical moments are also really important teaching moments, but they sometimes are difficult to facilitate. So we've actually found a way to include rich overlays and used historical sound recordings to evoke a historical setting. And one of the other cool things about this is that we were able to use some of the same computer vision techniques that the Street View team uses to align this automatically. And so let's take, for example, this recent expedition we created in partnership with Ken Burns and Major League Baseball and PBS to celebrate Jackie Robinson's life and legacy. This panorama is one scene from that tour. And it's of the March on Washington and how Jackie Robinson played a really critical role in the civil rights uh, fight for African Americans. And this 360 degree panorama is taken, was taken recently, and we found a historical photo from the March on Washington and overlaid it in the exact spot of where it was taken so that students could get a better understanding of that significance of what took place over 53 years ago. And current events are just as equally important teaching moments. But they, too, are often difficult to facilitate. Take two of the most catastrophic nuclear events that took place, Chernobyl and Fukushima. These are places that you would never, ever take students to. But it's actually a really important teaching moment. And teachers have had to rely on videos and news articles to explain what happened. 
But starting today, schools participating in the Expeditions Pioneer Program and our beta are actually able to go and visit Chernobyl and Fukushima and see for themselves what happened. And this expedition we have been creating, this is the first current event expedition that we've created in partnership with Getty Images. And we're also going to be working with Associated Press to create more current event expeditions so that students all over the world will be able to visit places that time and safety and geographic distance make virtually impossible. And beyond the curriculum, we quickly learn that there's even broader learning opportunities with expeditions. And it was the vision of others that helped encourage us to expand beyond that. And so the First Lady saw expeditions, and she had a vision for how she could use it as part of her Reach Higher initiative. For those of you who might not be familiar about the Reach Higher initiative, the First Lady has been encouraging students all over the US to apply and go to college. And she saw expeditions as a great tool to use in order to be able to enable students to actually visit colleges. There are a lot of students out there who lack the role models who might have gone to college, and they themselves might not be able to imagine what it's like to go to college. They might not see themselves going to college. And so we wanted to enable students all over the world to get excited about college, to envision what it's like, to see how much fun college is, not only all the people and the friendships that you'll make, but also all of the academic opportunities that are possible. And so being able to visualize what campus life is like helps encourage students to take that first step towards applying for college. And similarly, when Soledad O'Brien saw expeditions, she had a vision for broadening kids' exposure to careers. We know that kids dream about what they want to be when they grow up, but those dreams are often shaped by the professional people in their lives. And we know that getting exposure to careers is an important learning process, and this usually happens through internships. But what happens if you don't have an internship or you don't have mentors in your life? So we've been building a variety of career expeditions um, to show what it's like and what professional jobs are out there so that students can explore the day in and day out of someone's career. They can see what that person studied. They can find out what they don't like about their job, which is actually a really important learning opportunity. And we've worked with a number of, uh, of professionals, including um, the paleontologist professor for, professor from the American Museum of Natural History, and others like Pam Terrell, who's an airline pilot for American Airlines, and even an Aquarius, which I didn't even know was a career until we built it. You can laugh. It's okay. <laughs> and it turns out you learn a lot when you bring your product to one million students. So I wanted to share some of those learnings that we've experienced along the way. Number one, we know that teachers need very specific tools to do their job well. A teacher needs to be able to direct their whole class at once. They need to be able to you know, get their students' attention. And they also need to be able to see what their students are working on. And this remains particularly true in VR. Teachers aren't experts of every single place in the world. So to make it easy to direct their class, we provided, or content providers, provide the, the descriptions and points of interest of particular locations so that the teacher doesn't have to spend all the time researching and fact-finding. So let's take this panorama, for example. A teacher in the US may have never visited Buckingham Palace before and might not know that this is actually the portrait gallery in Buckingham Palace. And so with these descriptions and points of interest, the teacher is able to point out the famous Canaletto painting that's hanging above the fireplace. We wanted to free teachers' time up so they can spend the time creating engaging lessons and incorporate it into their uh, curriculum, not having to research all these places. And when we first built these tours, we assigned a grade and subject to them. We thought it would make it easier to find the content. But what we found was that the expeditions were only used by those teachers in those grade and subjects, which limited the use of the app. 
And we have over 200 expeditions ranging from a, uh, like all kinds of topics. And so we decided to remove those tags uh, for each expedition because what we realized was that the panoramas don't actually change. What changes is how the teacher actually applies them to the lesson. And the minute we did that, we saw expeditions used in the most creative way. Take, for example, this expedition of Egypt. An elementary math teacher used this expedition to create a lesson about how to calculate the area of a triangle. Pretty smart. And that same expedition was used in a world, high school world civilization class to teach about hieroglyphics and how ancient Egyptians communicated with one another. And that same expedition was used in a college art history class to teach about the art and architecture of, Egypt, of the Egyptian civilization. Now, if that had been labeled an elementary math lesson or math expedition, there is no way that that art history teacher in college was going to use that lesson. And so that was one of the key learnings that we had. And just like a normal class, it can sometimes be difficult to get a student's attention during the middle of a lesson. So imagine that in VR. Kids are super excited about expeditions and, and VR in general. And so after a few pilots, we realized that we actually needed to hit the pause, we needed to provide a pause button for teachers. So when the teacher hits that pause button, the screen goes black and it says, pause by teacher. And immediately you hear, oh, <laughs> can we go back? And you know, instantaneously, the students put down their devices. You don't hear the teacher say, now put down your devices. It just happens automatically. And the pause button is easily one of the most important features for teachers. And jokingly, they ask me if we can add that to all of their student devices. <laughs> and we also heard from teachers that knowing that students are engaged is really important. The way a teacher knows if a student is engaged is by looking at what they're doing, you know, writing something down or looking up at the board. And that remains really important in VR as well. But if you think about it, when you're in your VR viewer, the teacher can't see where you're looking. And that was definitely something that was missing from our app, was the student gaze. And so we realized that you know, when a teacher points something out, they need to be able to see if the, the students are actually looking at it. So if you look on the screen, you'll see these little smiley faces. And those smiley faces represent the students in a class. And so when the teacher points something out, you see this swarm of smiley faces to that point of interest. Well, if that swarm doesn't appear and you see students looking all over the place, you know that you might need to use that pause button and refocus the class. The other thing that we learned was that VR and expeditions empowers students to be teachers. <clears throat> instead of, you know, teachers don't have all the answers, and instead of having all the answers, what we found is that the teachers really serve as a facilitator. They build upon what the students are seeing and exploring from panorama to panorama. And without it, like across the world, we saw this thing happening where teachers would ask their students to explore a panorama, find something interesting, and then would invite a handful of those students up and actually point out that thing that they thought was interesting and talk about it and share it with the rest of their class. And this is exactly what Seymour Papert was talking about in the quote that Ben referenced, that the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. And interaction is really critical to add to this experience, and it's something that we know we need to continue to add to in expeditions. And we also know that learning happens outside of the classroom. Many of us would say that we're lifelong learners. And it, as it turns out, expeditions can be used for a broad range of learning opportunities beyond the classroom. We've actually been piloting expeditions in senior citizen homes and children's hospitals. And the feedback as well has been incredible. We have lots of requests from senior citizens to go and visit Verona, Italy to see the setting of Romeo and Juliet. And a lot of um, kids in children's hospitals has, have been asking to go underwater. All they want to do is pick up the goggles, hold their breath, go underwater, and explore the majestic Great Barrier Reef. And for that moment, 
Those kids are forgetting about their illness. They're smiling, they're laughing, and they're asking questions about what they're seeing and what they're learning. So now I'd like to turn it over to Ben to talk about group learning and expeditions. Thanks, Jen. So one of the things that, that we've seen is that, you know, one of the primary features of school, like I didn't love going to school when I was a kid, but one of the things you realize is that group learning is actually that's one of the best features of school, right? And an early decision that we made was to make expeditions fundamentally social. And many of the teachers we talked to, even the ones who had never seen a cardboard, who thought Oculus Rift was like a geological phenomena, they, they carried this like preconceived notion that VR was a singular isolated activity. So we took steps from the get-go to make it social, something you do with a group, like an actual expedition. It's not a canned experience as a result. Every time is different. It's a dynamic experience where your teachers and your classmates are the ones who are asking questions, making comments, and pointing things out. And while I've seen some great uses of VR to provide singular focus, it's really, really important, I think, for us as a community of people who are beginning to build out this technology to counteract this notion that VR is a fundamentally isolated experience. If you're not convinced of that, there's a good example from history, which was Edison's first attempt at the camera, the kinetoscope. Edison assumed that movies would turn out to be something that you just watched alone, and he resisted projecting movies onto a screen so that a bunch of people could watch at the same time. We all know who that turned out. <laughs> so lots of signals uh, that VR is super, super uh, important uh, to have a social element to it. Another key point, and this is certainly true basically for all technology, but especially for educational technology, is that making it simple and easy, and especially quick to get going, is really critical. I remember reading about there's some like warehouse in Florida, of all places, that the Air Force like, can make uh, super, super cold, like sub-zero temperatures. And they put planes in, in that to like, test them before they actually put them into high altitude. Classrooms are sort of like that sub-zero warehouse, right? They're very harsh environments in which to deploy technology. If, and it needs to be simple and robust, or it will fail. So we found that most teachers were actually really skeptical that they could even use VR in the classroom, not because they couldn't figure out how to use it, but because they were really intimidated by it, because they thought it would be too complicated to set up, because they thought it would be a distraction for their students. So we were super committed to ensuring that teachers who hated tech loved expeditions. And the best way to do that was to make it simple. We found that time and time again. It's almost defined by how few features it has. It doesn't require an account login. And we wanted to counteract as many of the technological prerequisites as we possibly could. So we made sure that it worked well on devices that student, that classrooms already had, um, like tablets. You don't need a cardboard viewer to do it. You can do it in what we call magic window mode, where you look in 2D. And if you've never used VR, if you've never used cardboard, uh, that's actually a really, really magical, amazing experience by itself. Another challenge we encountered was that getting expeditions to work in environments with little to no internet connectivity was really challenging. And that's a very common scenario, not just uh, in affluent schools, but in disadvantaged schools. Uh, many, many uh, schools do not have the network environment that would allow them to pull these super large VR assets down out of the cloud 30 devices at a time. We decided we couldn't wait for Google Fiber, so we built expeditions to work without the need for the internet. Basically, the guides device, that, that tablet that the teacher's holding, operates as a local server and it serves imagery to each of the connected clients, each of the devices in Cardboard, over the local Wi-Fi network. So as long as that tablet has cached the imagery from the internet at some point before, it works uh, without the internet, which means we can take this anywhere. We can take it to Ghana. We can take it to the rural Amazon. We can take it all over the place. OK, this is another one. Uh, getting beyond this wow moment. right? Obviously, we love these moments when students first experience expeditions, and you saw that in the video with Lance's class. Basically, any chance to see someone experiencing VR for the first time is a pretty magical one. It's an amazing moment. But the sort of immersion, immersion and engagement that VR provides is a bit of a moving target. What we consider mind-blowingly immersive right now will be considered table stakes at some point in the not-too-distant future. And we should be excited that technology will continue to push the boundaries of how immersive VR can become. So you should be really careful to rely too much on that initial moment of sort of awe and wonder that comes from first use. It won't ultimately mask poor designs, and it might actually distract you from realizing design flaws for a long time. A good piece of VR learning technology still needs 
to be actually fulfilling its fundamental learning objectives. It's not just about being fun or immersive or engaging. Measuring it can be really, really hard at first, but don't start entirely trusting your feedback until your users have been able to use it for a few hours or better yet, a few days or weeks. Get feedback, iterate, ship it, do it a lot. Like basically fundamental technology, but super, super important for VR. As Jen mentioned, this is one of the reasons that we embarked on the Pioneer program. So uh, hopefully we've seen a little bit how we think expeditions can transform the classroom today, but we're really, really excited about the possibility of more advanced VR in the classroom. And to talk a little bit about that, I'd like to invite Rob. I'm Rob. I'm going to look into my crystal ball and in 10 minutes try to tell you the future of VR in education, which is going to be really tough. Uh, I built a bunch of tiny little prototypes here at Google in a, in a group called Daydream Labs. And for the first time ever, we're finally sharing our work. So I am really excited to be here on stage and hope that everyone can benefit from sharing and seeing what we've been working on. So for now, a little bit more about Google Expeditions. Expeditions is amazing. And I am really proud to be on the stage with these two. Um, but we also are very cognizant that we're in the early stages of VR. Hardware will improve. Computational power will improve. Design patterns will improve. And some of the developers in this room are going to find ways to use VR in education that we haven't even imagined yet. This slide here shows a pretty common example of how evolution is portrayed. You can sort of think of it as this forward moving, intentioned direction. But that's not what evolution looks like in species. And it's not what it looks like in any other technology either. In any evolutionary process, we know that there are going to be false starts and dead ends. And that's why within the Daydream team, we're spending our time on these things called Daydream Labs. Put bluntly, even here at Google, we really know that we don't know very much about VR yet. Uh, so we're looking at highly experimental ideas that push the boundary of VR, force us to reconsider what's possible. And we're exploring this vast new territory right alongside you. We've gone back to first principles, and we've tried to set aside what we think we know about education and app design, because the best VR experiences out there aren't going to be other forms of media reimagined, or like pulled into VR and reimagined in VR. They're going to be built from the ground up in a way that really understands the strengths and weaknesses of VR. And in the near future, like I said, I hope we're going to see entirely new categories of VR educational experiences. Now, since we started this prototyping experiment, we've built more than 60 prototypes that cover a huge array uh, of, uh, of use cases. So I want to cover just a few of those. And this isn't just to show off our work. Hopefully, by seeing some of these examples, it'll spark ideas in your own minds. Uh, if you're curious to learn more about these prototypes, there are two talks that took place yesterday. One is called Daydream Labs, Lessons Learned from VR Prototyping. The second talk is called VR Design Process, Turning Fantasy into Reality. They're both already available on YouTube. But for now, I want to focus on these prototypes that we think can really have the power to change education. What we're looking at here is a molecule viewer. And so much of what we explore in education is at a scale that almost completely defies comprehension. From atoms and molecules all the way up to galaxies and superclusters, pictures and textbooks just don't get us excited about this content. But what if you could hold that molecule in your hand? And the app that I'm showing here doesn't just have a couple molecules in its database. It has an enormous collection, and it builds the model of the molecule dynamically based on what it knows about the chemical composition. I don't know if you're familiar with this molecule in particular. It's one of the foundations of life as we know it, caffeine. <laughs> so now let's go 31 orders of magnitude in the other direction and take a look at the Milky Way. Here we see our VR planetarium. And real planetariums are amazing, but here you're in control. You can pull a constellation from the night sky, pull it right in front of you to get more information. Next up, biology lab. Here, what we tell the student is that you're an explorer from an alien civilization in the distant future and you've stumbled upon this, this skeleton, and you're trying to learn as much as you can about it by assembling the bones into a human form. So a careful observer will see the different types of joints. She'll notice that when slender bones are paired together, those are the ones that go the farthest from the body on the arms and the legs. Hovering labels tell you that this is the radius and ulna, or the tibia and fibula, and all of these clues give you insight into the human body in a way that a textbook really never could. Here's our physics lab. And the key here is that there are two players in the same virtual space. Ben was talking about how you know, participating together and having this be social is important. Um, and these two players in the same virtual space could be in the same physical room, or they could be across the globe from each other. Either can change the physics parameters of the scene, like the mass of the bowling ball, and the objective is to set the values just right so that the bowling ball knocks over the, pen, the pin. 
And being able to share this experience really amplifies the fun. Next up is language learning. And this is such a perfect example for virtual reality. It builds on techniques that we've been using in conversational instruction to put you directly into the conversation. And in this video, we've turned on subtitles to help you understand what's going on. But if you've taken the time to just learn a few words in one of the previous sections of this educational app, you have no trouble participating in this conversation with these two young girls. In this case, VR does more than just make you feel like you're part of the conversation. It does that very well, but it also removes distraction so that you can really focus on the lesson. Now, when we're talking about learning, sometimes we just think about kids. But really, learning is a lifelong process. Professional skills, job retraining. How about a skill that terrifies most adults? Doing what we're doing up here, public speaking. What if you could prepare your talk by presenting to a simulated audience? We've seen VR used uh, to help overcome phobias, and this isn't really that different. Imagine, you know, public speaking is really uncomfortable for people who don't have experience at it. But in VR, you can simulate that stressful environment without fear of judgment from a real audience. So that's kind of handy. Um, now let's change pace a lot and go back to the days before Google and talk about the arc of educational games. <laughs> so how many people here died of dysentery? <laughs> Like, not as many as I thought, but uh, like a third of the audience here. Personally, I see Oregon Trail as actually leading a, a revolution in educational games. Because it was so different, it wasn't just a wrapper around a bunch of boring educational content. Kids can see right through that. And I see a lot of educational games where, where kids get spoon-fed a bunch of facts and then they answer a quiz. And this almost teaches them that, like, it almost reinforces that learning sucks, but if you do it, you get this reward of the minigame at the end. This isn't what we want to teach. And Oregon Trail took a really different approach. It didn't try to feed you this list of facts. It tried to put you in the shoes of an American, early American pioneer so that you can empathize with the difficulty of their journey. And this word empathy is really important because it's something that VR does really well. And at the end of the experience, maybe you don't remember how long the Oregon Trail is or what percentage of travelers died of dysentery, but you understand that it was a brutal experience. And because of that, the people who undertook that journey must have been willing to shoulder a lot of risk in search for a better life. Now, today, I think that this kind of experience is really hard. It has a lot of trouble for this kind of game, making inroads in education, because it's not easy to measure what the child learns. And if you can't prove that they're going to do better on the test, it kind of looks like a waste of time. And now, you might really want to come to the defense of this piece of childhood nostalgia, but the critics really have a point here. How do you measure the value of empathy-based education? And if you think Oregon Trail was on the right track, I think you'll agree VR has potential to really revolutionize this, but it's not going to be easy. Let's talk a little bit about what the ingredients are, are that we're going to need to create great, immersive educational experiences. And the three components that I want to focus on are these, immersion, interactivity, and measured results. That third one might come as a surprise. Immersion is where VR really shines. It's really hard to make a VR experience that isn't immersive. In this example here, even though the avatars are very simple and cartoonish, when you put that headset on and those little tar two cartoony little girls turn to face you, you want to respond to them. They, they have included you in their conversation, and you don't hesitate to respond. Then we have interactivity. Now, Expeditions, like most classroom experiences, is interactive in the sense that kids can look around and ask questions, but ultimately the teacher drives the content and the pace. And that works very well in classrooms, but what if we want a VR experience that someone can explore on their own, on their own pace, on their own time? And in this case, adding more opportunities for the viewer to drive the show can do a lot to make the material more engaging. In this two-player physics lesson example, the students have complete control over the difficulty level that they choose, and they're also solving the, the, the puzzle themselves. And solving that puzzle on your own is a lot more rewarding than watching somebody else do it or, or talk you through it. So here's the tough one. Finally, it's important that we measure how students interact with the VR experience. It's hugely rewarding to peek into a classroom that's doing a Google expedition, whether it's kids or adults, and see all those giggling faces as they travel around the world. But in order for VR to make real inroads in education, education, the subjective evaluation is not going to be enough. We need some way to measure how students interact with the app and demonstrate the resulting knowledge of a subject. And I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. People have been trying this for a long time, and it's really hard. Just, a pr a, just choosing an appropriate metric is hard, and then measuring those aspects without turning your application into a boring quiz is even harder. I think we're going to need to rethink both what we're measuring and how we're measuring it for these things to move forward. 
And this is why, to some degree, these aspects are in conflict with each other. I can make an experience that's more immersive, but it's hard to measure the impact. I can, make a, I can measure the, the impact by, by forcing students to answer trivia questions, but all of a sudden, it's not immersive anymore. Um, so it's going to take a lot of specialized skills to get this right. And those specialized sk skills are going to come from specific people. And I'm going to run through each of these here. Um, the first one, of course, is teachers. Like, teachers understand their students, and they can't be excluded from this process in creating these VR applications. They need the flexibility to make sure that the VR experience is tuned to the ability and the, and the, the style of teaching needed for their classroom. Next up, of course, VR designers. Uh, they know how to make an immersive experience. And, and even within th this group, I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of talent that's needed. You need to understand 3D modeling, interaction design, audio design, environment layout. You need to stand what, understand what types of motion makes people sick. Like, it's really a complicated thing. Then we have our classic game designers. These people know how to make experiences that are interactive and sticky and that elicit the desired behavior. Next up, and this is the one that I think is being excluded too much in this process. Researchers understand the metrics of education. Now, you might have heard it said before, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. In the context of getting your app out there to schools and really getting, getting impact there, the more apt expression might be, if you can't measure student improvement, your app will be discontinued. And the final element in the equation is students. Thankfully, this is a really easy one. Uh, the students are the ones who are the most open to new ideas in education. Because you don't see a fourth grader come home from school and say, Mom, I'm not convinced that this new curriculum is adequately fulfilling the pillars of the next generation science standards. They say we went to Europa. Did you even know that Europa is a moon of Jupiter and is entirely covered in a frozen ocean? How amazing is that? All right, so I've talked about the ingredients for great educational VR experience, and I've talked about who's going to be involved in creating them, but it's still really hard to give a roadmap of what the real process is going to look like. With technology, ideas, and patterns moving so quickly, it's really hard to guess what's just six months down the road. So take it with a grain of salt as I try to predict uh, how the next generation of educational v uh, VR experiences will come to be. I think it's going to start with existing VR experiences that aren't necessarily intended for education. VR game designers are going to make something that's incredibly compelling and that has a huge audience. From there, teachers are going to recognize an opportunity to use that VR framework for education. And Minecraft gives a great example of a game that's already been repurposed for education in all sorts of ways. From there, we're going to have to involve the researchers to figure out the appropriate metrics that allow us to measure the impact of the app on the student's performance without compromising the overall experience of that app. Working together, the designers, teachers, and researchers are going to figure out a way to put education at the core of that experience, rather than just making VR a light layer on top of what is otherwise an educational app. What I really want you to take away from these last few slides is that a great VR educational experience will require multiple disciplines. We need to engage new partners and get outside of our comfort zones. So I think they're going to play us off the, game, off the stage pretty soon here, but I'm going to try to have us all wrap up with our own conclusions. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, so I said at the outset we're really excited about VR. Hopefully that's pretty obvious by now. Um, I think it's actually pretty rare that we get opportunities like this uh, as a community of people that build technology. Uh, it's, rare, it's not rare to find like, amazing technology like VR, and it's not rare to find causes like education, but it's rare to find technology like VR that can so profoundly scale solutions to an imperative like education in a way that long-held intuition in science has told us is the right way. If all of us, or even some of us, get this right, it could change the way that we teach and learn. And one of the teachers, this one that we met in our expeditions pilot, told us that the superpower she most wants is to be able to make eye contact with all 30 of her students at the same time. Right? What an amazing idea. And it's probably too late for us to have this amazing teacher in our class, but it's probably not too late for us to give her that superpower in the near future. So we're just really, really excited to see that happen. And virtual reality will never completely replace physical field trips and travel, nor should they. But it's going to be, it's going to enable experiences to happen when it would otherwise be impossible. And not only will it be a democratizer of experience to individuals around the world and schools and the home, it's going to be an enabler of experiences to distant galaxies and Mars and microscopic worlds that would otherwise be virtually impossible. And I will simply conclude by saying, I want you to be prepared for surprises. 
that amazing VR experience that's going to revolutionize education probably isn't going to look like anything you have ever seen before. And I hope somebody here will help us find it. Thank you. Thanks.